Noah Webster actually said that everything was from this original language, and that's why his, his, and this was published in the United States in 1832. Noah Webster's Dictionary, which is where we get Webster's Dictionary, I know people here prefer Oxford's Dictionary, but in America we prefer Webster's Dictionary. One of the things that he does is shows how English is all related to Hebrew and Arabic. So it's a very interesting book from that perspective. He wanted to prove that the original language of man was actually a Semitic language. So he, he says, like, come here is from Qum to Ada. And he actually puts the Arabic in the dictionary. So it's, it's an interesting, curious book. But if you look at that idea of withholding what is due to others, there's an element of ingratitude that's harmful, both to yourself and to others. And it's something that will poison your soul. This is the idea. You will actually become poisoned. And wealth is seen. There's a hadith of prophetic tradition of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which he said that God has made a metaphor for what comes out of the son of Adam, meaning feces, as a symbol of the world itself. You see. This is how traditionally this was understood. And that's the low elements of the world, because the world is also something extraordinary. It's, it's, it's an epiphany of God. It's a manifestation, and it's the way in which we know the spirit. And so there's something very majestic and beautiful about the world, but there's also an element in the world which is the corruptibility of the world, the evanescence of the world, the fact that the world is deteriorating before our eyes, just as we ourselves are deteriorating. So these are signs for us if we would reflect. And then you move to the idea of fasting, and this is also to discipline our souls, because food is the primordial urge within the child. I mean, the child is screaming but because it doesn't have the breast. You give it the breast, and suddenly it's at ease. And so this is a very early impulse within human beings. And to discipline this aspect of the self means that other aspects of the self are easily disciplined. And then finally the Hajj, and this is a very important aspect of Islam in terms of five pillars, because what the Hajj represents is the unity of being, the unity of God. And you go to this point on the planet, and what you're celebrating is not simply the unity of God, but also the brotherhood and sisterhood of humanity. And this is a really important point that I'd like to stop for a few moments and look at. One of the things about pre-modern societies is that they were largely tribal. If you look here, for instance, you have the clans in this great land, Scotland. You have these clans, and the clans worked together sometimes, and other times they didn't. And you had differences that were sometimes ideological, they were sometimes political, they were sometimes religious, because when the Protestant Reformation occurred, certain clans maintained their Catholicism, and other clans converted to Protestantism, and this created uh, conflicts. So tribalism and clanism have often been sources of immense hostility between the sons and daughters of Adam. Now what's very interesting is if you look at Judaism, Judaism has evolved into, in essence, a tribal religion. Bani Israel, which is what they're called in the Quran, means the tribe of Israel. And traditionally, the Jews did not encourage people to convert to Judaism. In fact, the 613 Kishrat laws were seen as peculiar laws to their own tribe. In fact, the Jews consider it, to this day, Orthodox Jews, consider it easier to be a non-Jew, but you have to follow the seven Noahidic laws, or the Noahic laws. The seven Noahidic laws exist in both Christianity and Islam, which is why early Jewish rabbis actually believed both Christians and Muslims to be salvific paths. In other words, traditional Jewish theology, according to Moshe bin Mahmoud, who's known in the West as Mamoinides, one of the greatest Jewish theologians, said in fact that Muslims and Christians were both saved because they were following this Noahidic tradition or the seven Noahidic truths. And one of them was to set up courts of justice in which justice is practiced. If you look at Christianity, Christianity introduces a new element. Now there are verses that are somewhat paradoxical in the New Testament because in some areas Christ says, I've only been sent for the lost tribe of Israel. In some areas he says, 
I haven't come to remove one iota of the Old Testament, of the Torah, of the law. And yet in other places, there's an indication that he has universalized the message. And this is certainly what Paul takes as an apostle within the Christian tradition, universalizing the message of Christianity and spreading it, according to the Gospel of John, unto all nations. And so Christianity becomes a universal force and spreads throughout the globe, and that's why today there's Christians all over the world. Now, Islam, as it arose, it arose with a new doctrine also. Within the essence of the religious teaching of Islam, all of the teachings of Christianity and Judaism were actually maintained, and there was an extraordinary joining of these two traditions. So, for instance, in the Quran, it says very clearly, كَتَبْنَ عَلَيْهِمْ فِيهَا we have decreed to the children of Israel, to the Jews, in the Torah, fiha, in the Torah, a life for a life, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a nose for a nose, that there is retribution 